Well, we're going to move on now and go to energy. And one of the important things is Australia's energy regulator, the Australian Energy Market Operator, put out its 25-year roadmap about our future energy needs. This roadmap guides government, investors and business and comprehensively rejects nuclear on current costs, but highlights risks regarding the rollout of transmission lines and sufficient investment in renewable and gas generation. Today, I spoke with the AMO Chief Executive, Daniel Westerman. What this plan lays out is obviously the lowest cost pathway to meet Australia's energy needs as our coal-fired power stations retire um, and as our energy um, needs grow. You point out um, the lowest cost is renewable energy um, backed up with what we call firming, so you know, batteries and storage, um, but ultimately backed up by gas, uh, flexible gas power generation. You highlight transmission. Um, and we are uh, highlighting consistently, I would say, um, the need for around 10,000 kilometres of, uh, of transmission to be built. And that is to connect those new sources of generation and also to make sure that our power system is the lowest cost and resilient as possible. OK, so then take me to some of the social licence in regards to that transmission in particular. There's certainly been some aspects in rural Australia that are resistant to having those poles and wires coming across their land. Uh, and certainly that has been highlighted in particular by Snowy 2.0. Is this potentially a risk to the energy future of Australia? Yeah, you're right that um, there are many challenges in building uh, the transmission that Australia needs. And look, Australia's energy um, electricity transmission system was laid out over 70 years ago um, with a simple uh, kind of design to ta transport energy from places like the Hunter Valley and Latrobe Valley to our cities. And Australia really hasn't built transmission since then. So I think it's fair to say that as an industry, um, we're still learning on how to get this right. Um, there are improvements that are happening, um, so more consultation, more openness and more honesty with, uh, with communities, um, because ultimately that transmission is needed for uh, both energy security and to make sure that we've got the lowest cost energy. Um, a really core part, though, is, is really honest and open dialogue with our communities. Not everyone is going to like transmission, um, but it is needed for our energy future. OK, so there is one risk. A second risk is also gas in the system. You talk about those peakers being required to provide that ability to generate when there's no wind or solar. Uh, just take me to the East Coast gas shortages that are likely to be experienced between now and the end of this year, but potentially into the future as well, if future gas projects on the East Coast in particular do not come to fruition. Sure, and let's just put that into context, Ross. I mean, uh, we've got about 11.5 gigawatts of, uh, of gas generation in the national electricity market today. Um, much of that is actually going to retire, so it needs to be replaced and added to. Um, and this report shows that we'll need around 15 gigawatts of flexible gas generation in 2050. And flexible gas is the ultimate backstop for those dark and windless periods just like we've seen over recent weeks. And in recent weeks, what we've seen is um, a real sharp drawdown um, in gas storage um, in Victoria. And AMO has highlighted that to, uh, to the industry. Of course, the drivers of that are uh, limited wind generation um, and a, quite a cold snap, combined with a low output from the Longford gas plant, which is the main source of gas for Victoria. Uh, the warning that we put out was really a uh, please be aware of this industry um, and uh, what we're seeing is uh, people really taking notice of that. Uh, Longford has, um, has increased its production and the drawdown on that critical storage down at Iona uh, near Port Campbell um, has slowed down. So the message here is really that you want to send out a consistent message to industry that gives it the confidence to invest in transmission, gas peakers or future renewables. But on top of that, also to other industry to say, you know, we can bring energy prices to make them competitive with the rest of the world so that industry is not driven away from Australia. 
That's exactly right, Ross. I mean, what we're trying to do is to uh, send the right investment signals to industry. And it's industry who do make these investment decisions. They need to see that uh, the opportunity exists for their generation, storage, transmission projects and gas uh, projects, both infrastructure and supply, um, are needed. So these reports aren't forecasts of blackouts or lacks of supply. They're to send a real signal to industry uh, to make sure that those investment signals um, are heard. But then, as you're aware, there is the conversation right now about whether Australia converts to some sort of nuclear future as well. You've done costings in here. Now, admittedly, nuclear is banned in Australia. Nuclear generation is banned in Australia. You do acknowledge that as well. But the reality is, if that ban were lifted, would not the market then work out for itself, which was the best form of energy generation for future Australia? Yeah, look, I think the market is always best placed to uh, decide on the mix of generation. What we're forecasting is the lowest cost forms of generation in terms of renewables. Um, that is the lowest cost, and but they obviously need storage and uh, flexible gas. Um, but ultimately, investment decisions are decisions for investors and governments. Um, you're right that uh, the GenCost report uh, does highlight the costs of nuclear, for example, but we, of course, can't include any of that in the integrated system plan. That is a roadmap for the energy future, and obviously it needs to be implementable and within Australia's current laws and rules. Within Australia's current laws and rules, but if, say, that ban were lifted, would it send a mixed message if government were to invest heavily into energy generation in the future? Would that send the wrong message potentially to private investors who are otherwise rolling out storage or whether they're rolling out renewable projects themselves? Could that get in the way of the roadmap that you're laying out? Yeah, I think what we'd be hoping for is a real clarity of investment signal, um, both in the near term and the longer term. Um, and we're, we're seeing momentum in uh, investment really pick up. So I think what we're hoping for is that clarity of investment signal to remain clear to investors so that they can deploy their capital um, and meet Australia's energy needs going forward. And it's one of the issues right now, it's beholden on not just federal government, but state governments in particular, to lift barriers to future generation and also to future transmission to allow this pathway that you're creating, that you have built here, to allow that to actually come to fruition. Yeah, look, there are, um, I think, a number of barriers in, uh, in that the industry are grappling with today from global supply chains to higher costs to uh, even permitting of sorts. Uh, but what we know is that the transition is happening. There's a lot of investment already happening. Uh, and what we're searching for is uh, ways to uplift that investment, to um, expedite investment in the types of generation that Australians need uh, to have secure energy supplies, and that is renewables and storage, uh, flexible gas generation and transmission. And we should always remember that this is not just about supply, but it's also about the future prices that Australians, industry and households are going to pay. That's exactly right. And um, look, we're seeing uh, continued investment by mums and dads and businesses in their own rooftop solar, uh, which is one of the driving forces of Australia's energy transition. Uh, these rooftop systems, um, there's over 3.1 million of these in the national electricity market at the moment. Uh, they can at times supply um, just over half of all of electricity needs in the NEM. Uh, so consumers are right at the heart of this transition, Ross. Oh, Tara, Daniel Westerman, always good to chat to you and many thanks for your time today. Thank you, Ross.